Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture, and today I'm once again doing the show by myself. Uh, Brian and Mayor were not available, so uh, uh, I'll be here today, and I'm very pleased and very honored to bring you our two guests today, Flip Filipowski and Brian Plotz. And uh, those are names that you may recognize uh, because they, over the years, sort of operated in and around the periphery of the blockchain space, Flip is one of the co-founders and partners of Silk Road Equity uh, and Tally Capital. And previously, uh, because Flip has a very long track record of building companies and in the technology space, was Chief Operating Officer of Cullinet, which was a company that was um, one of the largest software companies in the 1980s. And after that, in the 1990s, uh, the founder of Platinum Technologies, which was also one of the largest software companies at that time, which in the late 90s sold for many billions of dollars um, to computer associates. And so we're very pleased to have Flip on to talk about his experience in the software space and specifically with regards to selling to enterprise. And Brian is the co-founder and COO of Silk Road Technologies, and previously was co-founder of A List Apart. So for those of you who come from the web development space like myself, um, will be very familiar with A List Apart as a, sort of a great resource for web development and um, web developers in general, uh, looking to expand their knowledge about web dev technologies, and that blog still exists now. And, uh, and today, they're both here to talk about their new project called FlurryDB, and FlurryDB is a blockchain technology stack that caters to enterprise and that specifically allows for decentralized distributed databases but that also have the benefits of blockchain technology in terms of immutability, um, permissioning, and all these great features that we often talk about. So we're very happy to have you both on today. So thank you for coming on and look forward to the discussion. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. So, I mean, we, we, could, we could spend this entire episode as sort of a how to, like, building software for enterprise. Like, we could just spend an hour t on that topic. Unfortunately, um, well, fortunately, there's also uh, uh, FlurryDB to talk about. Um, but I, I do want to spend some time brain picking, I, 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 suggest, I suppose, and talk about your respective experiences and what you've learned over the years and, you know, how companies today in this space can um, leverage these lessons from the past, right? Because a, a lot of the things that we see happening in the blockchain space today uh, in terms of technology adoption and sort of hype adoption curve and and all these things happened before and we've seen them before and uh, people that were around in the 80s and 90s and probably looking at, you know, all these young entrepreneurs and going, oh, like, what, what are these mistakes they're making? Um, but first, uh, please, I, I would like to both get your, perhaps starting with Flip, uh, respective backgrounds, and how you got to be interested in blockchain. I guess we could do some time traveling on this uh, question. But my background spans about the last 50 years. Uh, in 1970, uh, actually 1967, I began my career with uh, Time Incorporated. So I'm not going to go all the way back through that. Uh, it would take up the entire session here. But I am going to say that my particular background has always been in the enterprise space. Uh, I had a very substantial uh, role to play in the development of database management systems before relational database systems were in play. Cullinet was the purveyor of IDMS, a codicil standard database management system that replaced earlier technologies that I worked on uh, some of them became uh, DB2 for IBM. Uh, they became relational database systems. Uh, some of them died out. Some of them linger on a long tail, but I think I've been connected to most of the database technologies that have been developed over the last 50 years. 
I truly believe that blockchain is a very special thing. Uh, and those that recognized the internet for what it was benefited enormously. Uh, yes, they participated in a bubble that did uh, have its negative consequences for some businesses that were not ideally positioned, but for companies like Amazon, uh, who we today recognize as a giant in so many different uh, disciplines. If it wasn't for the internet, they could not possibly exist. Neither without the smartphone could we have a Uber or a Airbnb. Those are all things that are done on the basis or were done on the basis of recognizing some very special technology that could be utilized. Blockchain is that kind of thing, maybe even a 10x that kind of a thing. I think it will lead to decentralized organizations being able to exist. I think software, yes, will devour this world, and it will be on the back of blockchain that many of the new enterprises, some without any employees, uh, will be able to develop software uh, that will contribute to the benefit of all mankind. Uh, that's a tall order, but I believe blockchain has that ability. Yes, yeah, so that, that, that's a point of view that I, that I definitely share. Taking, taking from your experience and how companies have been able to navigate the changes that have occurred over the last 40 years, right? Or maybe even 50 years, right? Starting with mainframe computers and then databases and then the internet and then like the, the World Wide Web that we know now and mobile. What kind of things can we, what lessons can we pull from, from, from all the, what, what are the commonalities, I guess, between e all of these changes that you have seen that we should also apply to blockchain and that industry and, and enterprise companies should also look to as sort of a guiding light on how they should look at blockchain? Well, blockchain is this remarkable thing that I believe will be deployed uh, in manners that we have not yet imagined. In other words, we're very early in the way that blockchain will be utilized. Unfortunately, for most companies that exist today that are struggling to understand blockchain, just because this is the way the world seems to work, when new brand new technologies get delivered and people recognize them, a whole new host of successful businesses is formed around that concept. The old companies tend not to survive. In other words, there's a mortality rate of probably greater than 99%. So yes, all the current banks, all the current insurance companies, you name it, are all interested in deploying blockchain, but ultimately they will die because of blockchain. Uh, they won't move fast enough, they won't adopt, they won't change, they won't eat their young. And all of the things that have happened every time one of these new technologies has arrived uh, will happen again. I call attention to the fact that 10 years ago, well now maybe 10 years and six months ago, nobody knew what a smartphone was. And then in July of 1997, uh, I'm sorry, July of uh, 2007, um, Apple introduced the iPhone with all kinds of hopes uh, that it would have an impact, little understanding that one day almost everybody on the planet would know how to use it in a short period of time of 10 years. Uh, and I think that's, again, uh, the signal that everyone should have is if you don't move at breakneck speed, you are probably going to die because as an organization you weren't built around the technology that will drive the future. Um, so that's my contribution to that or that answer to that question. No, that, that's a great answer. And again, if, if we were to look back at how companies have adapted or failed to adapt to new technologies, 
Uh, I look at say the content industry, the film industry, uh, the music industry, you know, that we, we can point at specific successes and failures there, you know, e-commerce and retail. Um, you know, I, I came here to France about 10 years ago, just as e-commerce was booming. And I mean, we can clearly look at like sort of incumbent companies that had been there, like the, the sort of Sears's or, you know, or um, like these uh, retail stores that failed and like disappeared in, in, in a matter of a few years, but others that got through it. What, what would you... Uh, point to as good strategies for adopting this technology rather than looking at it as a threat or like how how, how can how can a, an existing company like a bank or, a, or an insurance company have some glimmer of, of of hope that you know they will be around in 10 years uh, I don't really think there is a glimmer of hope, but let's just say there is for the sake of the audience that is going to be listening to this. I know how much trouble I got into by predicting that Sears would be uh, missing from that list of uh, major retailers in a short order. I was probably a little bit optimistic they'd be gone sooner, but uh, they are for all practical purposes Kmart, and for all practical purposes Sears doesn't exist. and. Frankly, in the short order, it won't anyway. So what is the secret to succeeding? Uh, the secret is to create a side business and pour all the resources you possibly can into exploiting the newest technology. Uh, so for example, is anyone responding from traditional taxi cabs and transportation businesses to the Uber threat? Is anybody in the hotel business responding effectively to the Airbnb threat? Frankly, Uber and Airbnb have to worry about blockchain because with the deployment of blockchain, they will be de decentralized uh, anyway. They will be made irrelevant in the context of the next generation of Uber and Airbnb, which will have no employees and simply we run on the software that can be downloaded by those contributing autonomous vehicles as well as those that are picking up passengers. So there'll be certain applications that once you load them up, the only thing visible about an Uber and the only visible thing about uh, Airbnb will be the fact that it is software and it will probably have a lot of AI characteristics, but it will definitely be built on blockchain. So. I don't know if there's a successful strategy other than being very destructive of your existing business by pouring all the resources into the next uh, opportunity. And because that's such a difficult thing to do in business, most people just won't do it. They'll, they'll play with it. They'll cover their butt with it. They'll act like they're doing something, but they really won't be because they just can't sacrifice the existing business to this new technology. That that makes uh, a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, I, you know, again coming from the from the sort of commerce and e-commerce side, you know, before pre previously to being in blockchain, um, I think the companies that you know the few companies that were somewhat successful uh, that managed to to hold on to some sort of market share were the ones that invested in like other startups and, frankly, I mean, restructured the existing business. Um, you know. Huge job losses, like revenues down on those on that side, but you know are are seeing some success in in these smaller, more agile um, niche um, businesses that they were able to sprout uh, as a, as a means to um, adopt this 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 new technology, which was e-commerce ten years ago. Fascinating. I mean, I, I could ask, ask you questions all day, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, just to switch over to Brian. Um, I'd love to hear about your respective backgrounds. Uh, as I mentioned I, I, uh, earlier, uh, I, as a young web developer, like in the late 90s and early 2000s, learning to code and do HTML and CSS, like Alista part was one of my main resources for, uh, for learning all the hot new things going on and the CSS hacks and like uh, learned an awful lot about UX. Um, so uh, uh, you and, and, and Jeffrey Zeldman did a great job there and really benefited uh, to to that whole community and of course the list of part is still around and uh, I don't read it so much anymore because I, I don't code um, but uh, but I, I do see articles come up once in a while and it's always great to see it uh, there so yeah please please uh, tell us about uh, your journey uh, in this space uh, starting in the 90s and now how you, how you've got into blockchain 
Sure, yeah. Well, um, I'll be somewhat brief about it. I, I started my first internet-based company in my seventh year of college, so obviously <laughs> college wasn't uh, something I was very good at, and luckily I, I found a path um, through internet. So I, I was involved very early on, uh, and certainly the early days of the internet, uh, I believe, have a lot of things in common that we're seeing about the early days of decentralization and, and blockchain technologies here. Um, but uh, I have been involved now with uh, six or seven different companies and uh, starting them and, and being a, at least a core power, part of their origination. Uh, most of them dealing with uh, either enterprise software, internet-based internet uh, technologies. Um, probably one of the more influential times was that early internet era and you bring up e-commerce, certainly developed um, and participated in some of the largest e-commerce sites that were ever developed and really around that time when businesses were trying to figure out what to do. You know, they had their retailers, they, um, uh, which they had commitments to, they didn't want to upset. And at the same time, they needed to invest in their own web presences that would cut out the retailers to be able to sell their products. And uh, I think blockchain and some of the things that Flip brought up have the same characteristic that these existing businesses have to be able to kind of sacrifice their existing channels and the people that they're working with to be able to focus on uh, more direct initiatives if they're going to survive. Um, the last company I, I've been working, Flip and I have been working together now for since I think 1999, about 18 years. And the last company that we founded together was Silk Road Technology. Uh, Silk Road grew to about 500 or so employees. And the focus there was on human resources, talent management software. It's something that both of us are still very passionate about uh, and know quite a bit from being in the, the bullpen, so to speak, uh, around that. And of course, now our focus here is on building FlurryDB. And what, what, what lessons, uh, again, uh, I'd like to turn the question to you now, um, what lessons do you think we can pull from uh, from you know these early days of the web and so the, the 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 startups that were emerging in the late 90s and early 2000s that may be valuable for blockchain companies now and and the same sort of challenges that they're facing with regards to selling to enterprise and sort of thing. Uh, you know, one thing that I see, which I think a lot of the blockchain technology companies uh, perhaps not doing a fantastic job of, is marketing to specific customers. Um, and I think the early days of the internet kind of had some of this as well. I think that uh, ultimately people uh, buy solutions that solve problems that they're having, and oftentimes even the problems that people describe themselves are having aren't the real problems. You know, you kind of got to get down a level and really understand those issues, provide solutions that get people to buy. Um, there are hundreds of projects on anybody inside any enterprise's plate, and they're only gonna be doing two or three of them in a given year, maybe. And the key isn't just to have a problem that hits to that top 100 list. That's actually not that hard to do. The key is, how do you get into that two or three that actually get purchased and deployed? Um, and one of the things I do think I see a lot of the companies doing today is that they're building good infrastructure, which I think is important for longevity. So um, you want to have multi-purpose products that are kind of horizontal, that can be flexible and nimble, and that's going to be really critical to fend off the competition. And when you don't have that, assuming you are successful, it is crushing. It is crushing to have technology that cannot readily adapt because you, you're, you, you're just under so much technical debt, the competition picks up. Um, it's a very, very challenging place to be in. It's a place that I think anyone who's been in the software industry for a long time has found themselves in many times. But uh, uh, while building horizontal kind of enabling technology is important, in the early days, being able to market it to specific pain points and problems is the thing that's going to give you the chance to survive where the competition actually wants to you know, kill you and uh, um, get ahead of you. 
So both are important. I see a lot of kind of horizontal focus messaging right now, and I think some of that needs to get a little bit more laser focused for people to get to the next round of the fight. That's interesting. Um, this is this is something that I've been thinking a lot about in sort of my in my own business is this balance between spending a lot of resources on building the infrastructure and the resources that you spend going after specific problems and trying to solve them with like a niche product. And one of the things that I've seen happen that we've seen happen in the last few months, I guess, sort of accelerating the last few months is seemingly a sort of homogenization of the enterprise stacks, the different enterprise stacks that exist. And the the infrastructure layer, you know, from one company to another, uh, effectively selling to very similar verticals is, you know, clearly, I mean, it's, it's getting to be indistinguishable. What, what, what are your thoughts on this? And how do you think companies can differentiate themselves from others when, in fact, their, their infrastructure, you, you, although the technologies may be different, the implementation may be different, the, the, features, the feature sets are very similar, effectively. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes down to sales and marketing, which a lot of these companies are going to have to get very good at to survive. Um, you know, everything from thinking about verticalized sales forces uh, to just how you're positioning your problem, how you're getting into markets through channels. Um, all of these are, you know, there's, there's sort of a stew of strategies and you've got to kind of pour the perfect cup of the right ones to execute at the right time. And of course, every industry is gonna be a little bit different. I think if you think about kind of the, um, I guess a, a major force in particular business software is of course the traditional ERP vendors, the SAPs, the Oracles, they all had a similar stack. And one of the things that you saw them doing is, is verticalizing tremendously. I mean, they have vertical blueprints for if you're in manufacturing or a specific segment in manufacturing. This is exactly how you stitch together all these technologies to solve your very specific problems. And a lot of that um, ends up, uh, the differenti differentiator around that becomes uh, some of this sort of content marketing and some of the sales, but a lot of it's the services. It's the people that are wrapping together these specific solutions out of these general technologies. Fascinating. We, we could spend the entire episode and more talking just about this, uh, but uh, let's, let's talk about the, what we came here to, to discuss, and that's FlurryDB. Um, this is something that came across my radar very, very recently, and I, I read the white paper and, and thought it was very interesting, and, and, and I, I really appreciated the architecture and the way that you're implementing this technology. So uh, please tell us, what is FlurryDB, and um, what what problems does it address specifically in, in the markets that you're, you're targeting? Sure. So FlurryDB is a database that at the core of the database sits blockchain technology. So if you look at any database that really you've ever used, at their core is really um, records management and indexes. You know, that's kind of the aspects that power every database. And then there's layers on top of it. There's layers that enable easy querying. There's layers that enable security. There's layers that enable all of these sorts of things. And FlurryDB is, is similar, except at the core is blockchain. Um, and then we have layers built around that to support querying and to take advantage of it, uh, what, or take advantage of some of the unique characteristics it has. One of the reasons that we felt this was an important project is that we think blockchain technology obviously is important and can solve a lot of business problems, but we think it's pretty inaccessible to practitioners today trying to solve those problems. There's a lot of uh, niche solutions out there, and in any case, even if you can solve a specific problem that you're having using the technology, it requires you to adds a completely new component into your technology stack. And a database is a very natural place to have, I think, blockchain characteristics in. And in addition, every single application developer who's ever developed anything has used a database. They understand it, they know how it works. So fundamentally, they don't have to figure out how to kind of pull in this new component 
and how it fits into everything and bolting it into everything else that they're using, they can actually just use a database and get some of these characteristics uh, for free. So one of the, uh, I guess, key messages we have for FlurryDB is that it's making blockchain capabilities accessible for everyday developers. Um, and uh, addressing, I think, some of the challenges and the inaccessibility that current solutions, um, I think, have. So how would you position Flurry then in the context of the existing blockchain technology stacks that are you know, being sold to enterprise today? And how is it different from, say, other, I guess, similar uh, stacks like Big Chain DB that try to take this um, database, or I guess they try to blockchainify database, uh, is one way to put it. Well, I think if you're trying to leverage blockchain technology in an enterprise application, if you have a very specific use case that an existing technology, like an Ethereum perhaps, can uniquely solve, then that's great. Um, you can go to Ethereum, you can build a smart contract or whatever it is you're trying to accomplish and pull it in. I think the use cases for that, um, at least what we've seen the use cases, end up being pretty narrow. Um, so there's a lot of ideas, a lot of experimentation, just not a lot going into production at the moment. A lot of enterprise applications need to rely on simple things like storing data and the mutability aspects of blockchain are tremendous. But, uh, for example, uh, just using Ethereum, and if you were trying to store, say, supply chain data in there, and you came up with a gigabyte of data amongst your supply chain partners that you were trying to put, and a gigabyte of data isn't that much data. So, uh, right now, based on, or actually as of a couple weeks ago, I don't know what it would be now, uh, based on the current gas price, it would cost about five million US dollars to store a gigabyte of data on the Ethereum blockchain. So obviously if you need to store data related to your supply chain, you need to store it somewhere else and maybe there's a sliver of it that you're recording onto Ethereum because that's all that's practical. And by contrast, storing a gigabyte of data on Amazon Web Services and S3, for example, I think it's about 2.3 cents. So making that technology practical, I think is the core of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and that's just one example. And I think the other areas where existing blockchain technology, there's sort of this trade-off between uh, very public, um, being the public blockchains, very expensive and very slow. Uh, and I don't know that everyone always appreciates the cost of consensus. It's actually very expensive, both in terms of transaction time and money. You know, Bitcoin obviously taking 10 minutes to confirm transactions, um, Ethereum even 15 seconds. There's a cost in there that, that takes it out of the practicality for a large number of applications. And then we have kind of private blockchains, which perhaps um, have some advantages on speed, but then there's other sort of trade-offs. And another thing we really wanted to address with FlurryDB is allow you to take your application data and know that some of it probably does want full public consensus, and that's gonna come at a cost, which is fine. Some of it can sit internally and be private, and some of it might be shared amongst organizations. Why shouldn't you be able to have all those characteristics in a single system? And uh, FlurryDB aims to address this, we call this concept hybrid consensus, but the idea that you can actually align the data with the consensus needs that the data requires, and not try and put all your data in a public blockchain at a massive cost, when not all of it needs to be there, only little parts of it need to be there. I, mean, I, I do agree with you 100% that you know, as these technology stacks mature, we're going to see a sort of segmentation of the different blockchain stacks, and they will interoperate. I mean, we're already starting to see this, but it, it does make a lot of sense to say that there's something like Ethereum um, has the ability to uh, perform transactions uh, at a cost, right? And and those transactions are of, of a specific nature, and and they're mostly related to you know putting some kind of a some some kind of business logic execution in a blockchain, and and the blockchain recording the state of that. But if you want to store, on the other hand, like massive amounts of data, 
um, in an immutable way uh, that's sort of compliant with regulation and like GDPR and this sort of thing, you're going to need something different from that. But that's that's very similar to the way that we build, you know, traditional web applications today. You know, you've got your Ruby development stack, and then you've got and within that you have the different layers for for data, for APIs, for for the for the business logic itself. And and I, I feel that we're going in this direction in blockchain as well. And anybody who fails to see that just needs to look at <laughs> look around you and look at the way that we build web applications today. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to do it otherwise. So then if if from, from, from what I understand of reading the white paper and, and looking through your website, uh, FlurryDB is is a stack of of technologies that incorporates this all, all these notions that we know uh, about blockchain. So that's like immutability, the the ability to record the state of data in time, um, access controls, uh, these sorts of things, but does it in a way that where you can store significant amounts of data in a no SQL format. Um, can you expand on some of the technical aspects of, of uh, FlurryDB? Yeah. And I guess the first part is that I wouldn't consider it uh, a no SQL. Um, in fact, it's much more of a graph database. Okay. And it's a graph database that actually supports ACID transactions, which if anyone's built, you know, enterprise applications, they realize how important that characteristic is. So it differs in this way from a MongoDB or a RethinkDB or BigChainDB, which you brought up, which is also uh, built on these NoSQL things. So the idea that you need to perform atomic transactions across various tables simultaneously, they either all succeed or fail, is a pretty important characteristic that much enterprise application relies on, certainly not all of it. Um, and I guess one of our main goals of this is that we had to be, at least in our opinion, the best database out there for people to adopt this technology. And the idea that blockchain can exist in everything we do, just like you know, we, we draw parallels back to early days of the internet, and there were a lot of companies that started out that were trying to do internet something, and you know, internet is now in everything. It's just a feature. And blockchain, I believe, should also have that, um, that same quality. Everything that we develop, and it might not be this year or next year, but everything that we develop will have this feature set in it. So one of the things that we went about doing is we were kind of reinventing the database. We thought a, a graph database is a great format, sort of offers some above and beyond capabilities uh, over a relational database. But since we are actually storing a full immutable history of all changes to that database, what else can we do to really leverage that characteristic? And so one of the things we built in is this concept of time travel, point in time queries. So every single query you issue to the database, you can issue as of any block in history or any wall clock time you can use any point in history, the identical query, and you will get an instantaneous result. So you can't do this probably with any database that you're used to seeing. Um, they always only answer, as of right now, here is the answer of that question. You can't say, what's the answer to this question a year ago without going to a backup tape and restoring the database if you still have it as of what a year ago. What do you think ago. that is? I mean, as I was reading the white paper, I was thinking, look, this, this is so, this is insane that it, like no database uh, stack that, what we use today, like SQL or NewSQL or Mongo or whatever, have this capability built in. It seems like something that would be like you have this. You have this in like you know pages on you know your Mac, right? Sure. For like Word documents. Why wouldn't you have this in databases? Well, doing it and doing it at scale is not necessarily a simple thing. Um, so that's definitely one aspect. And um, I'll let Flip talk about sort of the constraints that existed when the databases that we're just sort of used to and accept today were created, they, they had much different constraints than we have today. I mean, that is exactly the point. The word constraints fits. When those relational databases were built, they were built with the knowledge that the current technology, everything from the cost of disk space to the cost of CPU processing, had a certain limitation on the deployment that they could make. Today, those constraints, for the most part, have disappeared. 
The reason why the oracles and other SQL-based systems are vulnerable is because they're dragging along a user base from the 70s. Uh, they have all of that baggage to support, and they cannot abandon the theories that they, were, that they used in order to create the product in the first place, those being you have to conserve this, that, and the other. Their logging mechanism was created not in an era in which disk was cheap. It was created in an era where disk was very expensive. And they really can't dramatically change that. They can't backfill in with blockchain. Uh, they can't add these features and simplify uh, the way that you can if you're starting from scratch, knowing what the technology constraints of today are. And I think that answers pretty much the question of why there is little hope that the existing technologies will be able to move into the new era uh, with immutability, with uh, time travel, all just basic features of uh, technology that we use to store data. When you have some of these new capabilities too, it's, a, it's a amazing. Certainly I have and other people have used this. Um, you start to change how you develop things. Uh, for one, there's a certain comfort knowing that you have everything that ever happened, uh, right? You don't have to worry about like data just disappearing or losing some update or something like that. But with enterprise systems, you're constantly dealing with issues like uh, backup processes, you know, that run at midnight and they take a half hour to run. And the whole time the data is changing underneath the database and lots of times things fail because the relationships that existed at midnight are different than the relationships that existed at, at 12.15. Well, if you could grab the database and treat it essentially like a variable that you have as of a specific point in time, you can, when you wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning and you realize that something didn't run successfully, you can actually examine the database in that identical state at that point in time and figure out what happened. Or when a customer calls and said, hey, you know, this price on this product, I swear, said something different an hour ago, and, you know, the support rep looks at it and says, I don't know, you know, it says the right price now. Well, of course, there might have been a number of changes. No one can track that. And all of a sudden, you have the ability to better support customers. Um, there's just all sorts of things that you can start to approach differently. Uh, we built a specific application, which we could talk about later, uh, a cap table application that really leverages Go ahead and this. Let's, let's, uh, let's dive right into that. Yeah. Sure. It was a good example application. For one, we wanted to build some applications that leveraged our database um, that we could go out and get customers using on a production scale. So we could test out the technology and performance characteristics and, of course, start tweaking it. And one of the applications we decided to build was something that manages a corporate capitalization table. And this is something through years we have seen startups try to manage this on spreadsheets. Different people have different versions. Someone thought they had, you know, 1.37% uh, based on something they were told in February. And, you know, now they're getting something and says they have 1.36%. And what changes? I mean, this is constant. So the idea that you could build an application and put zero additional effort into... Um, a feature set that would allow you to rewind history to any point in time and get an instantaneous response was a pretty you know, powerful concept. And from an application developer standpoint, they had to do zero extra to introduce this capability. So one of the things we put in the UI was just a, a clock in the upper right hand corner where you can go set that clock to any point in time in history and actually use the entire application as that application existed at that point in time. And if anyone's tried to log out history when they've developed an application, they know it's a lot of effort. First, you need to decide up front what you're going to be tracking history of. You end up creating a totally separate set of tables to track that data. The relationships that that data had, oftentimes you're not also tracking, so you don't know the relationships that existed at these different points in time. It's a massive effort. And this was really a, um, a, a really useful use case, but something we were able to create that added um, quite literally zero additional effort from the developer standpoint to have this sort of capability. It's a pretty powerful concept. Very, very interesting. I, I can I can definitely see how you know if you, if you indeed if you have this technology stack that you can 
just plug into your existing application and you know, sort of reap the benefits of this this idea of time travel. And we'll get into the sort of technical aspects in a second here, but if you could plug that in and you have all those benefits and, and you have the immutability and you have all the compliance and all that stuff, then there's there's no reason not to just use this instead of something like a graph database that you would typically use. Um, so let's let's talk let's spend some time then on the on the technical uh, infrastructure and some of the elementary components of FlurryDB. One design decision that we made is that we wanted this database to be able to scale and be extraordinarily fast. And so part of the challenge of that comes with consensus. And consensus, you know, even if you're getting down to five second consensus times on a public blockchain, from a database standpoint, that is extraordinarily slow. Um, so certain data aligns well with that. You know, if you're used to uh, trying to settle a, uh, a stock trade and that takes three days to settle and you can settle that in five seconds, that's pretty fast for that. But for a database, maybe, you know, doing something that has, or any application that has any type of, any type of real-time characteristic, uh, that is way, way too slow. And there's certain physics that get involved. I mean, I think that we will see kind of these uh, consensus or block times and a lot of blockchains continue to decrease, but there's gonna be a certain limit that they are gonna have a hard time getting over. I don't know what that is. I, I suspect it's gonna be a few seconds is gonna be a real challenge for any blockchain to get beyond, assuming they have broad global um, consensus taking place, but we'll see what happens there. So one of the design characteristics um, we decided to do was what if we could segment our data to leverage different consensus modes to take advantage of the privacy and speed where we need privacy and speed and the transparency which comes at a cost where we need and we are willing to pay that for that transparency and cost. But if from an application standpoint, if you could treat that even though the, these different segments of data as though they're one single database, the applications you're developing can remain extremely simple. They're just talking to a single database. The database itself and where that data comes from is coming from different consensus modes. And so this, this kind of brought us into the realm of actually doing a graph database joins essentially across different databases or segments and treating them as a single database. So that was certainly one aspect of what we were looking to do. The other is that we, um, uh, when you're building blocks, you really require a notion of a kind of a single threaded transactor. Uh, something always has to know the, uh, the state of the database at a given time. And you can't necessarily do that in a fully distributed way. And certainly blockchain or all these other, um, uh, or Bitcoin and all the other blockchains don't do that. Of course, they're distributing consensus, but only one node is developing that at a given time. And they're working for, from the truth that they understand. Um, so what we did is we actually built the query engines as a separate layer, which you can scale. You can run a thousand query engines or however many your application needs for performance characteristics. And it's the query engines that you're actually issuing your, your application queries into. And they will relay transaction data to your sort of single transactor for your database. Uh, so that's another important characteristic of how we look to scale this. Interesting. So at the moment, looking at your website, it, it looks like there are multiple stages of how this will be deployed. So it, currently, I think you're um, at the stage where one can deploy this sort of internally and um, have all these features uh, that, that we mentioned. And then further down the road at some point, we'll have the... Um, the ability to deploy this as a federated sort of consortium blockchain, uh, say for like a consortium of insurance companies or banks or something like that. And then in the future, uh, further down the line, I think the idea is to have a, like a public network um, that one can use, you know, with any type of application. Um, talk about the different, because I mean, it, you know, the, all of these deployments 
uh, would require different types of consensus, right? If you've got a fully distributed network that requires some kind of consensus, you're presuming that the validators are or uh, anonymous or pseudonymous. And if you have a more federated model, then that requires a totally different type of consensus. Um, have you given any thought yet about what this is going to look like as you deploy these different, um, I guess, types of um, stacks for these specific types of use cases? Sure, yeah. And I think each of the use cases um, leans towards a different model that makes sense. So the idea is that we will support multiple consensus models and you can choose to use something that more aligns with a, uh, the needs around a fully decentralized public consensus model. You can use that internally if you want, but in many cases it doesn't make sense. So around a feder federated model, um, what we see a typical requirement being is a group of you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, whatever it is, companies, deciding that they are going to run a, um, a database decentralized but amongst themselves. And in that scenario, essentially, there is a process to determine who's going to be invited into that. Uh, they have the equivalent of an account, essentially, on the database, which they can authenticate and participate in. And consensus uh, will most simply be driven in that model by... Um, some percentage of essentially validation around transactions that happen. So it might be that you know 80% of the nodes that are invited to participate into this database have to say yes, this transaction or this block. Like you may have a sort of tenderment style Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, essentially, which is like a voting mechanism. Yes. Yeah, a voting mechanism where they would approve and, and then, uh, of course, whoever is producing the block or performing that particular transaction um, can rotate. These are all things that different business requirements we feel like will dictate you know, different configuration options. And I guess the key there is that we want that to be configurable um, to meet the needs of the particular use case. In what we call an internal mode, um, there's, you know, I guess one question would be is what's an internal blockchain and, and what benefit would that provide? Uh, and we think it provides a couple benefits. One is um, thinking back to this idea that you want your applications to be simple in how they interact with the database. So if you are using a public consensus database, maybe part of it from a feder part of your database is from a federated model. You're also, as a business, going to have internal data that you have no desire to share. Um, but our ability to connect all these databases together will end up making sense that you run one of uh, a blockchain transactor internally. The other benefit you get is you do get a pretty strong sense of tamper resistance from that. So a tremendous amount of money is spent on auditing, of course, with companies. And you know we've been doing this for years, even as a software organization, trying to comply with SAS 70 or now the SSA 16 or SSA 18 compliance. We have to hire auditors. They come in and they start looking through our paperwork and our emails and make sure that we're following um, all the controls that we set out in our certification, which might be you know, terminating uh, access to systems for employees when they leave the company. Within a certain amount of time, they might be you know, regular performance of disaster recovery activities, whatever those controls happen to be. By having a core immutable blockchain, even though you're running it internally, provide this tamper resistance, it actually significantly eases the job of auditors, and we think it has a potential impact on that industry. So that's sort of the internal model. We talked about the federated model, and of course the last model, and the last one we intend to fully launch would be the public model. And really the vision for this is that you can launch a database and you set up for that database how much you are willing to pay for people to keep that database active. Um, so that may be in terms of per megabyte hour. You would pay for that via some sort of token. Um, and you are essentially inviting miners to participate in that. And of course, the more you're willing to pay, the more miners you end up having. And again, that will vary based on the needs of your application. Um, they may be such that you want tens of thousands of miners, in which case, if you're willing to pay for that, you should be able to easily achieve that. 
Or it may be that you only care about 10 because that's the nature of your data, and that's fine too, and you would end up paying far less than that. And then you end up also paying, obviously, for transactions to cr be created. Um, our default consensus mode uh, for that is gonna be a proof of stake mode. And uh, you know, there's some other in intricacies in there. The thing that we are exploring and that we would very much like to move towards um, is a concept around proof of capacity. And of course, you know, the only coin that I'm aware of that's really doing this to some degree at scale right now is Burst Coin. So we're looking at some of those technologies and that's a very interesting mode of consensus for us. Um, but right now, proof of stake is sort of uh, the table stakes for us, but we're also exploring a couple other aspects and they may even be configurable. And one of the things we actually want to see with this public blockchain mode is the ability for people to launch a database, for example, to store climate change data or to store genomic data or other sort of kind of altruistic information and have the ability to set a price for miners that they're willing to pay to run that database, which in those cases might be zero dollars. And people will want to mine that database because they believe in climate change and they believe in storing and having permanent records of that data. Um, so the idea that people can launch databases and set a price for it and even have global databases of sort of critical information um, that nobody's paying anything to mine, people just want to mine to be able to help out is something we would like to see. Yeah, I, I agree that the, there's a massive benefit in, in having these public database um, infrastructure layers readily available for anyone, anyone to use. I mean, the, I, you know, one of the close things that we have to that today would be something like the web archives, right? That archives uh, the web um, and has been for you know, many years. And you can sort of go back and look at the version of a website uh, from 20 years ago. You know, if, if a snapshot has been taken, on the other hand, you can't look at say API data. I mean, you can't say like what was the uh, what, what what was the result of this API call five years ago or ten years ago or even just yesterday. And I think there would be there's a lot of benefit to having that. Now, if you can have that as like as a publicly available network that anybody can 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 access and applications can plug into and 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 um, send data to it and it can be stored there, then it, you know there's there's all kinds of great applications for that that obviously serve the public good. I'd like to come back to that. You mentioned reg, uh, compliance, and, and I think that obviously this, this is a, this is a, a great idea. Um, so sort of if you are to look at it from an internal perspective and how um, this type of technology facilitates the job for like an auditor that comes in and says, okay, well, I mean, I, I know that I have all of the records here because the database says so, and it's it's sort of built in that I can time travel and go back, and I I have the immutability, and I, I have the digital signature of those who signed those transactions. On the European side here, and we've been talking a lot lately about GDPR, which is of course this General Data Protections Regulation that will come into effect this year, and companies like just a few months out are still struggling to 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 figure out how they're going to be compliant with GDPR and all of its requirements. And so it, it, I'd like to get your thoughts on how GDPR or how FlurryDB can address some of the requirements like right to be forgotten, uh, you know, consent of, uh, of a user in regards to how their data is used, things like recording, reporting requirements and that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So we talked a little bit about this concept of time travel and having the history and how it can impact and I think benefit uh, application development. Um, and the whole area around auditing and compliance is one ripe for efficiency. And I can say just our last company, Silk Road Technology, we spent um, almost $100,000 a year, not, not including our financial auditing, just for our service organization auditing. And auditors would come in on site, and essentially what they would do is look through chains of emails, look through documentation, and just try to be able to demonstrate that no one manipulated any of the information that we're ultimately providing. And if you sort of get back to the source of that and you have a database that can prove that tamper resistance, I think it eliminates um, a huge amount of the work that they're you know, uh, basically coming in and do, playing detective about because you do have this source of truth that's difficult to manipulate. 
when we talk about the right to be forgotten, um, that is sort of at, uh, almost as odds as it can get with the concept of a public blockchain that never forgets data. Uh, so how can something like that be addressed? So I think there's a couple of ways of, of uh, having that type of data in Flurry DB if it is the type of data you want to store there to be able to do so. One is that um, FlurryDB does enforce a strong um, schema. And it does this because essentially it needs to run autonomously. Um, so it has to have a lot of strong rules around it, exactly what can go where. And we also support a notion of database functions and uh, database transaction functions that actually allow data to be manipulated within the database itself. Uh, one of the things that we have as a flag for an attribute is that you can set up data that you're looking to store publicly is encrypted. And it takes away a couple of features. So we can't, for, uh, we can't do, for example, autonomous or, or database functions on encrypted data very easily anyway. Uh, like if you were trying to increment a counter by one, well, if the number is encrypted, you don't know how to increment it, for example. But leveraging encryption is a way to solve this uh, right to be forgotten. So if you are storing the personally identifiable information in an encrypted manner, if you're storing a set of keys to decrypt that data separately, um, the right to be forgotten can be as easily as uh, deleting the key, no longer having access to the key. So the data is technically there, but it's garbage. It's nothing can be done without the key, and therefore um, it is inaccessible to anyone. Another concept is leveraging our ability to actually do joins across several databases simultaneously. So if you have a unique identifier on the public blockchain that does not have any personally identifiable information on it, that can be joined with uh, in internally run FlurryDB where you do have that personally identifiable information. We do allow when you're running, when you control consensus, we allow one specific feature to address this problem in particular, which is the ability to completely retract an entity. Now we still store a record that that entity was retracted, who retracted it, why it was retracted, but we can actually eliminate data when you're running it internally. So by doing this join, part of the data can be public. You can't obviously ever tamper with that. It is out there, it will never go away, but you're joining that unique identifier with the identifiable information internally, which we do give you the ability to permanently erase. Um, or the other option is, is you know, figure out why you need to store this data on a blockchain to begin with. And you know, it isn't necessary, and in some cases it may not be. Great. Uh, th that's all very fascinating. I, 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 I'd love to talk some more about the technical aspects. We, I know we could go on for very long here, uh, but we do have to wrap up, unfortunately, in a few minutes here. Uh, before we do, though, uh, I, I would like to address one thing that's very interesting about this about this this company is that you've set it up as a public benefit comp corporation. Flip, could you talk about why you chose this structure and what 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 is a public benefit corporation? It is. Uh a easy thing to describe in the sense that it is a permanent charter document that says you will do these things for the public good. Um, and it is not easy to retract. It's an immutable characteristic of a corporation uh, that regardless of who might acquire you, regardless of what investors you might attract, there will always be this component uh, that you exhibit in the, in the operation of the corporation. So you saw, I think, and heard Brian mention there might be certain kinds of blockchain-based databases that are created that are really for the public good. Uh, there's also education that can be provided uh, in order to provide folks the opportunity to redirect their activities in life after their job of being a taxi driver or their job of being in the transportation retail business is eliminated by what is no doubt going to be um, the case in the next five to ten years, uh, many of those jobs will suffer. They may not be completely eliminated, but enough of those jobs will be eliminated. Um, and we believe that there is a requirement 
uh, for organizations to understand the impact that technology is going to have, whether it's AI or blockchain, and to do something about it in order to contribute uh, to the well-being of everyone in the community of human beings. And we have that as part of our charter. And so what are some of the things that, uh, are the specific things that, uh, that your company is sort of um, within the charter says it will do? Um, can you point to anything specific? Yes, I think that uh, in, in a short sentence, uh, uh, encapsulating what it is, is to take individuals and promote entrepreneurship as well as uh, the necessary skills required to create these autonomous organizations. Um, the software that will be uh, required over the next decade to be built in order to define the economy of the future. Fascinating. Uh, I think this is very needed in this space. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of a lot of jobs will disappear in the next, you know, five, ten, twenty years. Are disappear or, or will 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 morph? Will change? I think the landscape of employment will be very different in the next two decades. And if if companies that are contributing to that change can somehow uh, make some sort of an engagement that. You know, to society that they will contribute to help make that change as smooth as possible for the people that would be affected. You know, that's something that, uh, that we all stand behind, I think. Yeah, it's important to understand that the nature of a human being's relationship with a corporation is going to change. And that many, many years ago, a model taken out of the Civil War military complex is the current model that we have in our current corporations on how we relate to the subservient role of an employee. Uh, and I think that's going to change. Uh, it's going to change many, many different ways. But one of them will be is that there will be a peer relationship between organizations and the contributors to that organization, the contractors that may, on an open source basis or in some other way, provide the technology that drives these businesses successfully. All of that has to be rethought. Uh, and we hope that in addition to providing the stack of tools for this, that we will also somewhat uh, alleviate uh, the, the complex problems of unemployment that will result as a, uh, as a result of uh, these various technologies being available. And the, I guess, the Moore's Law of making them reach singularity in uh, the not too distant future. Well, it's a very noble cause. Um, so before we wrap up here, uh, can, can we get some, some insights about you know, sort of development roadmap? Where, where are we currently? I mean, I know you mentioned all these different, you know, the different steps in deployment, so the federated model, the public network, um, can you give us some kind of timeline here? And also, uh, I, there was one thing that should be said is that currently FlurryDB is not open source. Um, why is that? And do you plan to open source it sometime in the future? Yeah, sure. So on the open source question, um, absolutely, we plan to open source it. Um, it is, you know, in, in the fairly early stages, we have been working on this technology now for three years. And... Our first major milestone was earlier this year actually building and deploying enterprise applications that are leveraging our technology. We're, of course, we're the primary user of the technology, but we're able to prove it out. And that has gone extraordinarily well. So as of about a month and a half ago, we opened up the technology to beta users, and we are in the process right now of working with several organizations, uh, software companies uh, primarily, who are looking to use FlurryDB to back their applications and bring these concepts of immutability and blockchain uh, to them and some of the benefits that they provide. And really our next milestone uh, after that will be to lift the beta label. And we plan to lift the beta label sometime within the next one to two months. And shortly thereafter, we plan to release a federated model where companies can run Flurry um, decentralized, but amongst a federation of companies. 
And that is something that we are uh, looking to do by the second quarter of 2018, so not too far away. And it's probably around that time that we will have enough experience working with these companies on incorporating Flurry DB to feel like our protocols are sort of the right protocols and some of the methods that we have there are the right methods to um, open source the technology. So that's, that's around the time frame that we look to open source the technology and get more community involvement in the code base itself. Um, and then of course the last main step is the, um, uh, you know, the fully public blockchain. That is something of course we would love to accomplish before the end of this year, but some of these other steps and sort of how they go will help dictate our timeline for that last piece. That sounds, that sounds great and we'll look forward to seeing the developments of uh, FlurryDB and, and hope to see maybe a public FlurryDB network sometime in the future. I know that that's something I'd, I'd be very interested in, uh, in dabbling around with uh, in, in some capacity. Um, so guys, we, we could go on for, for days here. Uh, I feel like I've got so many more questions to ask you. I guess we'll, we'll probably have to have you on at some point again in the future, perhaps you know, uh, when, um, when this dust gets deployed as a public network, that might be a good time to have you on again. Uh, I just want to thank you for being guests on the show. Uh, and, uh, I hope that everybody uh, learned a lot today from, uh, from just your, your experience, uh, in, in technology and, and, uh, developing, you know, enterprise software. Uh, I thought it was very valuable. Thank you. Really appreciate you having us. And thank you to our listeners for once again, tuning in. Um, we release new episodes of Epicenter every Tuesday, uh, sometimes on Wednesdays, depending on when we can record them. Uh, so do subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud. We're also on YouTube or your favorite podcast app on iOS or Android. Uh, you can support the show by leaving us an iTunes review. It helps people find the show, and we're always very happy to see those. And you can also send us a tip. Uh, the tipping addresses will be in the show description. We, we accept tips in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ether. And thank you to those who have been tipping us over the years. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.